this is block five, the Roaring Twenties, section uh, five, isolationism, uh, with the section starting with the term isolationism. Going back to uh, George Washington in his farewell address to the American people, um, the United States traditionally had been a country unconcerned with countries around the world. And Washington said, stay clear of entangling alliances was the term that he used. Uh, and the fact that America was you know, such a big place with a continent to, to conquer uh, made the United States not particularly concerned with foreign affairs traditionally in its entire history. That changed, you know, as we know, with progressivism and American imperialism, and then, of course, the United States sent, you know, millions of men to France to fight in the First World War. But the sense that Americans should not deal with the rest of the world was then, uh, after World War One, even stronger, really, than it had been in a long time. That World War One was seen by most Americans as a waste of time. Uh, a waste of money, a waste of life, and a waste of giving away, you know, their 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 liberties and their freedoms uh, to fight the war. And the public soured uh, very quickly after World War One on the fact that Americans had fought in World War One, uh, and a spirit of isolationism did start to pervade many many Americans, especially uh, Americans uh, in the Midwest. Uh, and in the prairie and on the mountain states, Americans that were even further away from the rest of the world than you know, Americans on the coast. Um, the United States was protected by its, or um, imagined that it was protected by its vast oceans, you know, the Atlantic and the Pacific, and that the rest of the world could really stew in its own juice. Uh, and the rest of the world could deal with its own problems and not involve the United States, which had you know, things of its own to do. Um, you know, an economy to rebuild, you know, prosperity to enjoy, um, that the world was a dangerous place and people came to America to get away from the rest of the world and that America would really have no, had, had no business involving itself and that its involvement uh, for, for the, you know, from the Spanish-American War through World War I, many Americans believed, was a mistake. Um, and this sentiment was, um, was electorally captured by the Republican Party. The Republican Party was generally an isolationist party during the 1920s and 1930s, um, and did not want much to do with the rest of the world. The rest of the world was corrupt um, and dangerous, and there was communists out there. And, uh, the United States was a place where you could get away from all the nastiness of the rest of the world. And it was a very powerful idea, it's still, still, politically a very powerful idea that the rest of the world uh, should just go stew in its own juice. It's not the United States' responsibility or job uh, to be involved everywhere at once. Now, that being said, do not assume that the 1920s, that's why there's a question mark after isolationism um, in the title of the section. The United States did not, as you know, popularly and commonly assumed, completely just withdraw into this turtle shell of isolationism. But the United States still did deal with the rest of the world. It just did not do it from this crusading idea like Woodrow Wilson had to make the world safe for democracy. In the 1920s, American, um, the American response to the rest of the world was kind of you know, one with a gimlet eye. Uh, that they looked on the rest of the world as something that you, know, you had to deal with, but you certainly didn't enjoy doing it. All right, this is block five, Roaring Twenties, part five, isolationism, uh, with the section beginning with disarmament. It was a belief among many people that World War I um, was begun and made worse by the fact that all the countries of Europe were armed to the teeth, pointing guns at each other. And the idea went that if you could reduce the amount of guns and tanks and planes and bombs, you would reduce the likelihood that these countries would use all of these guns and tanks and bombs and planes and mustard gas and all the other nasty implements of war. So a huge movement in the first part of the 20th century, uh, it was before World War I also, um, was the disarmament movement, that countries should give up their armies, give up their navies uh, as much as humanly possible. So after the carnage of World War I, this idea went, went right back into vogue, uh, became a very popular idea again. Uh, and in 1922, there was a big meeting 
uh, called the Washington Naval Conference. And a bunch, uh, the, now the Washington Naval Conference uh, met in Washington, and its job was to try to reduce the number of uh, battleships that the main powers had uh, in the Pacific. And the countries concerned uh, were the United States, Great Britain, and Japan. And they argued over um, you know, how many ships, how much the ships could weigh, tonnage of the ships, the size of the guns on the ships, uh, to try to create some kind of... The, you're trying to avoid an arms race. You're trying to avoid, well, if Britain has two battleships, Japan needs three. Then if Japan has three, Britain needs five. If Britain has five, Japan needs seven. If Japan has seven, Britain needs nine. And, you know, and so on and so forth. That is the goal here. That is what is trying to be avoided here. So a ratio was set at the Washington Naval Conference. And the ratio that was set was five to five to three. That for every five battleships in the Pacific that Great Britain had, the United States could have five and Japan could have three. And that was intended to reflect the fact that both the United States and Great Britain had these large colonial empires in the Pacific and Japan did not. That the Americans and the British kind of said to the Japanese, what do you need all of these battleships for? We need them. We have these big empires. We need to protect them, protect the trade. What do you need them for, Japan? Um, and the Japanese said, oh, you know, we want them for this, that, and the other thing. Uh, but the 5 to 5 to 3 ratio was established. Countries would have to, and here's the, this is a World War I style battleship right here. Uh, countries would uh, be able to check up on the other countries to make sure that they were not, you know, hiding battleships places. Uh, they would, there was tonnage um, that I think battleships could max out at 30,000 tons. Um, so that reduces the ability to build big, giant battleships. Um, but again, there is not really much of an enforcement mechanism. What are you going to do if a country starts secretly building a battleship that is much bigger? Are you willing to go to war over that? Who knows? Most people during the 1920s and 1930s are not willing to go to war over that sort of thing. So this disarmament reflects this ideal that if we somehow reduce the number of guns and ships and planes, that will somehow reduce the likelihood of countries going to war. Okay, this is Block 5, Roaring Twenties, Part 5, Isolationism, with the section beginning with uh, U.S. involvement in Latin America. As the United States had been involved in Latin America for a very long time, the United States continues to be involved in Latin America in the 1920s and early 1930s um, for the same reasons, that the Roosevelt Corollary, corollary uh, continues to be applied where American troops are landed to make sure that debts are collected. Dollar diplomacy continues to be uh, applied as Americans invest in American companies based in these Latin American nations. Um, American troops landed in Nicaragua and were there until 1933. Uh, they were active in Haiti until 1934, all doing the same sort of thing, uh, making sure that debts were collected, making sure that uh, bills were paid by these constantly ill-run Latin American republics. Troops land in it also not only to collect revenue, but also to try to uh, reform those countries' economies, reform their tax collection systems, Limited success, although American companies in Latin America were incredibly wealthy and provided wealth to a lot of American workers, uh, not so much to their Latin American workers, uh, and these sorts of things created ill will and bad blood between the Latin American republics and the United States to their north. Block 5, the Roaring Twenties, Part 5, Isolationism, and the Nine Power Treaty. The nine power, the 1920s are a time of lots of treaties. Um, treaties to do this, treaties to do that, treaties to assure this, treaties to assure that. We're going to see there's kind of a theme going on here. That there's a whole heck of a lot of treaties, people signing nice pieces of paper saying that they're going to do this, that, and the other thing. But there are very few ways to enforce those treaties. Uh, there was the League of Nations, but the United States, as we know, did not join the League of Nations. Uh, the Nine Power Treaty is one of those examples of these treaties. It's a treaty in Asia. Uh, 
The United States is, and Britain too are, is concerned that Japan is growing more assertive uh, in the Pacific and starting to make claims on things that the United States and Britain did not think Japan should be making any claims on. And they started, you know, uh, involving themselves in China, saying that they wanted, you know, st stuff from the Chinese government, wanted territory, wanted rights, wanted trade. So the Nine Power Treaty was a treaty all the powers involved in the Pacific uh, to affirm the open door policy. Uh, to say that the open door policy, from all the way back from imperialism, we remember that's Roosevelt, McKinley, Roosevelt, Taft, that anyone could trade with China who wants. Um, the Nine Power Treaty reaffirmed the open door policy. We are going to have the open door policy in China, that's what we're all going to do. Japan, watch it, we're watching you. The problem with the Nine Power Treaty, uh, it also provided for Chinese territorial integrity that no one would be carving off pieces of China and annexing them. And this is going to be an issue uh, we're going to see before World War II. The problem with this treaty, along with so many other ones, was that it lacked an enforcement mechanism. Okay, all nine countries sign off that open door policy is there, no one can carve off chunks of China, but how do you guarantee that that's going to happen? No one said, well, if you do that, then this is the consequence. There was no mechanism for enforcement, um, that none of the countries wanted to be um, roped into a war uh, that they might not want. So things were put down on paper, but there was really no way to make sure that those things written down on paper were enforced. And the Nine Power Treaty is one of those many, many agreements. This is Block 5, the Roar 20s, Part 5, Isolationism, and the kellogg briand Pact. The kellogg briand Pact makes a lot of people make fun of it. Because the kellogg briand Pact uh, was a treaty that outlawed war. That everyone signing this treaty would no longer uh, ever go to war with anybody else who signed the treaty. I don't know how you can prevent war by signing a piece of paper, and that's kind of what critics, you know, at the time and from them said. But it's this idealistic attempt to say, after World War I and the horrors of it, no more that to, to, to go and kill 10 million people as an instrument of national policy is, is immoral, wrong, and evil. Uh, so the French foreign minister and the American secretary of state um, the American Secretary of State Kellogg and the French Foreign Minister Riyad, there they are, put this treaty together and everyone who signed it outlawed war as an instrument of national policy. Now, we can easily make fun of this. But in the end, what it did do, if you sign a piece of paper saying that it's illegal to go to war, if you do go to war, you are now violating the treaty. And today, you can be charged in the International Criminal Court, uh, and the Nazis were charged at Nuremberg after World War II for violating this law. Um, obviously, it cannot prevent countries from going to war, but what it has been able to do is hold the losers of war accountable for starting wars um, that they may not have, should, should not, may not, um, was a good idea to start. Uh, so the kellogg briand Pact tries to outlaw war as an instrument of national policy, and it also um, legally holds countries accountable, um, or has been used to hold countries accountable uh, for going to war. Uh, all right, this is Block 5 of the Roaring Twenties, um, Isolationism, and the section beginning with uh, German war debts. As you hopefully remember, the Treaty of Versailles required Germany to pay the cost of the war. And it had to pay, it could not pay, uh, which turned out they had a big meeting where they determined that cost to be $32 billion. Uh, and that $32 billion could be paid in three ways. It could be paid in goods. Uh, so there are pictures in the 1920s of Germans pretty much shipping entire factories and locomotives and things that are actually worth things into France. It could be paid for um, in, in gold, um, which is a, you know, a, a medium of exchange that everybody always accepts. And it could be paid in foreign currency. 
that Germany could not pay its war debts in its own currency. The German economy was devastated by the war. It was all that it could do to get itself back up on its feet. That there was near starvation in parts of Germany in 1918 and 1919, uh, especially the winter of 1918-1919. People were going hungry all over Germany. The economy was in such a destroyed state. In 1923, in an effort to buy foreign currency, the German government, the German Republic, the Weimar Republic, started printing marks, which is the German currency. And they figured the more marks they print, the more foreign currency they can buy with the marks and then pay off their war debts. What they actually created was the world's best known instance of what's called hyperinflation. That the German mark soon became literally worth less than the paper it was printed on. That you can look, these are stacks of money that these German kids are just playing with as toys. That by the end of 1923, it cost about four trillion marks to buy a loaf of bread. That people carted around money in wheelbarrows and on the back of ox carts. And before long, the currency is so worthless that people stop using it entirely, that they can't just keep up with the number of zeros that are appearing at the end of the currency every other day. And that the German economy just crashed to a halt. Uh, it went back to a barter economy, that the money was literally worthless. It was done that Germany engaged in this inflationary attempt, uh, in this attempt to inflate its currency to more easily be able to pay back its war debts. Um, but it failed. People stopped accepting marks uh, for any amount of gold or any amount of foreign currency. It was the economic dislocation. Now, Inflation destroys a middle class. And the middle class in Germany, the strongest middle class really in Europe, had come through the war and was starting to get back on its feet in the 1920s, was completely destroyed. People's savings were wiped out. Um, people could, it, it destroyed the German middle class. And it started to radicalize the German middle class. Um, in 1922, the year before, that the inflation of 1922-1923 is what starts to make people like Adolf Hitler attractive to regular middle class German people. Because the, Repub the, the, the Weimar Republic, the Republican German government, uh, clearly was not doing very, very well. And this hyperinflation is just the best example of it. Now, how did Germany still owed the money? They still had to pay it back, and this was exacerbated by another problem. Germany owes this thirty-two billion dollars, but Britain and France had also borrowed money incredibly to pay for the war, and they had borrowed money from the United States. So we have a couple things going on here. The United States is owed billions of dollars by France and Britain. But France and Britain have no way to pay this money back. Their economies have been incredibly dislocated by the war. That the, that the war was actually fought on the most productive land in France. That 40% of French factories, 30% of French farms were destroyed because all of the fighting on the Western Front actually took place in France. So the French economy is decimated by the war. The British economy is decimated by the war. Um, that they you know, brought all of the economic resources of their enormous empire to bear, um, but were heavily, heavily in debt. Uh, the war had worn factories out. It had not, I mean, forget the material costs, that, both, that the British uh, lost about 900,000 men in the prime of their economic life, and the French lost well over a million. Uh, casualties in the war. And those that's just productive workers that an economy struggles to replace. 
the manpower losses and the material debt that Britain and France owed to the United States was a problem in these countries. So Britain and France demanded that Germany pay them the reparations only so they could turn around, take that money, and pay back their loans to the United States. Germany can't pay Britain and France. And if Germany doesn't pay Britain and France, Britain and France can't pay the United States. And Americans started to get pretty pissed off at the British and the French. We can, and the, the attitude is, we crossed an ocean, we paid for your war, we saved your bacon, we saved your ass, we won the war for you, and now you can't even pay off your loans. Brit the British and the French asked for um, renegotiation of the loans, the Americans refused. Remember, in 1922, 1923, in the 1920s, Americans are pissed off that they went off and fought this war in the first place. They did not, in retrospect, think it was a good idea. And the economic recovery that is happening in 1923, 1924 in the United States is being threatened by um, these problems. So an American by the name of William Dawes um, steps in with what became known as the Dawes Plan. And the Dawes Plan, in a way, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, well, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever saw in my life. But it, it worked for the seven or eight years that it was in function. The law, the Dawes Plan said, all right, American banks, what you're going to do, you are going to lend money to Germany. You're going to give Germany loans. The Germans are going to use those American loans to pay the reparations. And then the British and the French will go pay back their American loans. It's a giant merry-go-round of money. So what's happening, and you can tell very clearly, that the United States is loaning Germany money. Germany pays its reparations with American money. The British and the French pay the Americans back with their own money. It's a giant, but it makes everyone's balance sheets look a lot better. Um, and this worked from 1924 to 1929, the five years it was in operation. The German economy recovered, the British and the French economies recovered. As we saw, the Americans uh, had this long period of prosperity, um, and that the war debts, although still a problem in Germany, you know, there's a lot of communists in the streets arguing against them, and there's a lot of Nazis in the streets arguing against these war payments. They were made until 1929. In 1929, when the whole financial system collapsed uh, and the Great Depression began, uh, the payments were suspended. Uh, nobody could afford to make them anymore, with one exception. Little Finland um, continued to struggle and paid back all of its loans to the United States, uh, its World War I loans. It was the only country to do so. It paid off its final World War I loan. It made its payments every single year uh, until about 1999. And then they were paid off in full. Watch your hands. Uh, so this is the Dawes plan, how to keep um, Germany paying its reparations, the British and the French able to pay back their loans, and the American financial uh, industry happy.